All right, well, this morning we're continuing in Acts. We're going to be looking at uh, Acts 21, verses 15 through 26. Kind of given you already an overview of it, but let me just go ahead and, and read the text. Beginning in verse 15. After these days, we got ready <clears throat> and started on our way up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also came with us, taking us to Manasseh of Cyprus, a disciple of long standing, with whom we were to lodge. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they began glorifying God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. And they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses telling them not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Therefore do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, having decided that they should abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from fornication. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. May the Lord bless again his word to our understanding this morning. Now, last time <clears throat> we saw Paul heading toward Jerusalem, and we, we noticed first the places that Luke recorded and some of the things that Paul saw. And I thought this was such a marvelous illustration of what has been going on in the world since our Lord Jesus Christ came. First, they went to the island of, of Kos, famous for its worship of, of Aesculapius, who is the Greek god of medicine, and the birthplace of Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. Next, to the island of Rhodes, which was distinguished for its Colossus, one of the eight wonders of the world, the huge bronze statue that formerly had, had straddled the entrance to the harbor, but which now lay prostrate at its mouth. And Patera, the city known for its temple and oracle of Apollo, all of which places contained really the relics of idolatry. But then how after they passed that area, how they went by Cyprus, the island that Paul had evangelized on his first missionary journey, stopped at Tyre, the city, remember, that had been scraped off the face of the earth in God's judgment, but had been rebuilt and was now the home of a Christ-honoring church. How they sailed to Ptolemais, where they visited the church that had been planted there, and then landed at Caesarea, another city with a community of believers where they stayed with Philip for several days. As Paul, again, making these travels, saw the decomposing remains of idolatry, and then the flourishing churches that God had established, he must have been thinking how, God, how basically Satan's kingdom was falling, but how God's was growing through the gospel. I can imagine that Paul also must have been encouraged that all the hard work he had done, all the suffering that he had endured had not been for nothing. God was being glorified through the advancement of his church, and that is all really that mattered. And as we were reminded already this morning, that's all, really all that should matter to us and what we should be living for. 
Now we saw second the warnings that the Spirit was giving Paul everywhere he went that he was going to be arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Gentiles. How the disciples, because they loved Paul and because God was using him to further his cause in the world, how they tried to stop him uh, from going. But how Paul was still determined to go out of his love for the Lord Jesus Christ knowing that this was his will, knowing that he was going to use this for his glory, and knowing that he was willing to do whatever the Lord wanted him to do, so long as the gospel is promoted. Now this morning, we see him arrive in Jerusalem, and we also see again what, what's going to be our main point is how he ministered to the saints there. And I think there's an important lesson for us to learn, but there's actually several along the way. Now, first of all, we see what happens when he arrives in Jerusalem. After spending many days in Caesarea, some of the disciples from the Caesarean church set out with Paul and his companions for Jerusalem. They took him, Luke tells us, to the house of Manasseh of Cyprus, okay, a man who had been a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ for some time. Uh, likely converted when Paul had evangelized Cyprus. Remember, that was where he went on his first missionary journey. Now, as Paul had become a servant to Manasseh in bringing him the gospel, you know, the word of life, and, and introducing him to the Lord Jesus Christ, now Manasseh was going to serve Paul by providing him a place of lodging during the Feast of Pentecost. Remember, Paul was trying to hurry because he wanted to be in Jerusalem during this feast where there would be many more Jews gathered and many more opportunities to share the gospel. Uh, during this time, places to stay would be scarce. So Manasseh was going to provide that place for him. Uh, Paul reminds us in Galatians 6, verse 6, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Now, the interesting thing is here, you know, no one should ever be the center of service, the one who attracts all the service to them, you know, the one who wants all the attention. Paul is the one who gave all of his attention to those he was seeking to save. And then those who were saved were seeking to give him all the attention and to be his servant. In other words, we're to serve one another and not really seek to get others to serve us. Now, we also need to remember that Paul was a wanted man. Uh, we're going to be reminded of this next Lord's Day, of what happens in the temple when they see him, they arrest him. But to associate with Paul would have put these men at risk. But I want us to notice that, that these companions of his, these disciples from Caesarea and Manasseh, they were willing to do this because they loved Paul, because they loved Christ. And again, because they wanted to advance his kingdom. They were putting the kingdom first out of love for the Lord. Let, let me just say here, love, as we know, makes us more like Jesus. It moves us to lay down our lives for others. Think about what Thomas said. When Jesus told his disciples that you know, he needed to go to Jerusalem... Uh, you know, he was going there to raise Lazarus from the dead, and, and the disciples were concerned because, hey, the Jews of late wanted to kill you, Jesus. If you go there, they might want to kill you. But when Jesus said he was going, Thomas said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. You see, the, this is the heart of a disciple. You don't hold on to your life, but you give your life for the sake of the gospel. That is the heart of a genuine disciple. And again, what the Lord is working within us, what He desires to work within us. Now, when they arrive, the church warmly received them. Again, we see that what Jesus says is true in John 13, verse 25. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Again, the church warmly received them because here are brothers, brothers in the Lord who have been risking their lives for the cause of Christ, and they love them. You know, they, they had an affection for them. They received them. They wanted to take care of them. Again, another example of this love at work. The next day, they went to see James. 
Now, this James, remember, is not one of the sons of Zebedee, not John's brother, because he had been martyred for his Lord earlier by Herod in Acts chapter 12. You know, again, willing to lay down his life for the sake of the gospel. This James was Jesus' half-brother, the one who, as he was growing up and even after Jesus began his ministry, was not a believer, but apparently became one, uh, perhaps when the Lord rose from the dead, because it's interesting, Paul singles James out in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, where he says he, he appeared to the disciples, and then he appeared to James. And James was not an apostle. He was, again, the half-brother of the Lord. He was not the son of Alphaeus, the James. He was not one of the sons of Zebedee. He was not the son of Alphaeus. But he was, again, the Lord's half-brother, uh, a child of Joseph and Mary, converted perhaps at the resurrection, but we know one who very early on took a leadership role in the church, the one we saw basically seeming to exercise some of that authority at the Acts 15 council. And this is the James who was also the author uh, of the book uh, by the same name. This man, um, I, I, we see him here, of course, in leadership role, but was well-respected, not only by the church, but also by the Jewish community. And the reason why was because he had a very high regard for the Mosaic Law. Now, we, we see that in our, in our text this morning, but we also see it in the book that he wrote, okay, the book of James, which has been called the Proverbs of the New Testament. Because in this book, he seeks to explain and apply the Ten Commandments to the Christian life. Uh, the, the book, that book reminds us, not just that book in the New Testament, but it certainly that book, reminds us that Jesus did not fulfill the requirements of the commandments uh, merely to give us the perfect righteousness we needed. He certainly didn't do it to free us from our obligation to obey the commandments, but rather did it to give us the power to obey them remembering that the commandments are really the commandments that describe the kind of love that the Lord wants us to love with. Jesus lived and died to give us the power to love as He loved, according to the law of God. Now, there's no mention of, of, of the apostles being in Jerusalem. I think by this time they had been dispersed throughout the Roman Empire preaching the fulfillment of God's promise to send the Messiah to the Jews. We need to remember that Jesus came first to the Jews because God had made the promise to them. And they needed first to hear the gospel, which is why, again, Paul tells us wherever he went, he went first to the Jew, and then he would go to the Greek. Now, we're going to see in, in R.C.'s study on the last days that this had to take place before the Lord would bring an end to the Jewish age and the beginning of the times of the Gentiles in 70 AD. The Jews had to be reached because God had made the promise to them. He wanted them to know the promise had been fulfilled. Here is your Messiah. Receive him. They, they had to have the chance to do that before in 70 AD the Lord destroys the temple, destroys the city, and basically brings in what's called the age of the Gentiles. That is where the gospel is going out to the entire world in order to provoke the remaining Jews to jealousy that they might receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there were also elders who were present here. And again, we're reminded that everywhere the apostles went and planted churches, they always appointed elders. And not just one, but a, a plurality of elders not only that the churches might have oversight and those to, to shepherd them and to help them, but that the elders themselves also would have accountability. Now, after Paul greeted them, he began to recount for them what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when James and the elders heard it, they began glorifying God because God was doing a marvelous work through his people. He was advancing his cause. They didn't praise Paul. They didn't say, wow, you're such a great and gifted guy. We're, we're glad that, that you know, so many people came to Christ through you. But basically, we are thankful for how God used you 
to reach others with the gospel. You know, Jesus tells us in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus is telling us here that if we belong to him, he will bear fruit through us. According to the parable of the sower, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold, we may differ among one, you know, each other as far as how much the Lord bears through us, but each of us will have some fruit. And the point here is that when God grants this fruit, when He, he gives us the grace to do something that, that is actually you know, praiseworthy, that we make sure we direct that praise and that glory to Him because He is the one who has done it. If we were separate from Christ, we could do nothing. But attached to Him, having His life within us, having His Spirit, we can bear fruit, and He is the one who gets the glory for it. Now, secondly, we see Paul's ministry to the saints there, and this, this is really our main point, how he uses his liberty in Christ to further the gospel. Now, after they received Paul's report and thanked the Lord for it, James immediately turned to a concern regarding Paul's reputation. Not that he thought this was true, but he believed that many believing Jews did in verses 20 and 21. You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law, and they have been told about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. Now, by this time, the gospel had spread throughout Judea. Thousands of Jews had been converted to Christ. You know, we know there were 3,000 at Pentecost. Shortly after that, at the healing of the lame man, 5,000 more were converted. We're told in Acts chapter 2, the Lord was adding to their number continually, day by day, those who were being saved. By this time, the word that James uses indicates that there were countless thousands of the Jews who had believed. Now, Jesus said the kingdom was going to begin small. Remember, like a grain of mustard seed, or like the smallest seed of the garden, the mustard seed grows into a great tree, or like leaven, which is placed in the dough until it works through the entire lump and it's all leavened. It begins small, but its influence continues to grow, and we see it growing, continuing to grow. There have been times of, you know, of great growth and times of small growth, but it, it is always moving forward. And that's something that should give us, of course, encouragement and confidence as we go out to serve the Lord, that He is always pushing that kingdom forward. But th this success, in this case, apparently also presented a problem, and that's what we want to look at. James says the problem was that these believing Jews, he's not talking about unbelieving Jews, but believing Jews, were zealous for the law. Now, he's speaking here about the ceremonial law. Okay? He's not speaking about the moral law. We all should be zealous. We all need to be zealous for the moral law, for the Ten Commandments. Remember, Jesus came to give us the power to keep those commandments so that we might love God with all of our hearts and mind and soul and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. Okay, Jesus came to give us the power to keep that law, but the same thing is not true with regard to the ceremonial law. Okay, when Jesus fulfilled that law, by sacrificing himself, he actually abolished that law. It was no longer the way that we were to approach God. Now, through the gospel, we come directly through the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So, he comes to give us the power to keep one. He comes to actually abolish the other. Now, we also need to bear in mind that the Lord never intended either of these laws to be the way by which we might be saved. That's something else we have to distinguish. He gave us the moral law to show us our guilt, that we don't love God, we don't love our neighbor as we should. And He gave us the, the ceremonial law to point us to the only sacrifice that could ever take away our guilt and give us the power to obey the power 
to love. To believe that either of these laws can save us is essentially legalism, okay? We can't save ourselves by the keeping of the law. And that was at least partly behind the Judaizing heresy, which is what was dealt with at the Jerusalem Council. But legalism is not the problem here, okay? It's, it's you know, that it was wrong for the Jews to be zealous for the ceremonial law. Now, they were allowed to keep this law. That's something that we see throughout the New Testament. They could keep it as long as they didn't rely on it for their justification, for their salvation. Again, remember the classic example when Paul says to the Galatians, if you are circumcised in order basically to be made right with God, as the Judaizers were telling you, then you have fallen away from Christ. But then we see Paul take Timothy and have him circumcised because of the Jews in the area, because they knew his father was a Greek, so he wouldn't offend the Jews in the area. Well, don't be circumcised, but, but then he goes and he circumcises. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is the Galatians were being circumcised to justify themselves, whereas Paul had Timothy circumcised to keep the traditions so as not to offend the Jews. There was a different motive. They are allowed to keep the ceremonial law as long as they do not rely on it for their salvation. This, the ceremonial law, is a matter of Christian liberty. You see, in the new covenant, these Jews, as well as James and Paul himself, still considered the ceremonial law as something that was precious. Okay? because these were the traditions that they had grown up with. I mean, basically, this was their culture. It shaped their culture. And these were the things that God had used to point them to the Messiah. Okay, so the problem wasn't that they were zealous for the ceremonial law. The problem, he locates the problem here, was that these Jews believed that Paul was teaching the Jews who were outside of Palestine, those who were living among the, the Gentiles, to forsake Moses, not to have their children circumcised, and also to do away with the traditions. Essentially, that Paul had taken the decision at the Jerusalem Council and had applied it to the Jews as well as to the Gentiles. Now, as I read this text, you must have been thinking about Acts 15 and the Jerusalem Council and what happened there. And you'll recall at that at that council, the question that was considered was whether the Gentiles needed to be circumcised and keep the traditions, the law of Moses, whether, you know, to be saved, whether they needed to become Jews before they could actually become Christians. Well, the conclusion was no, because God had already given them His Holy Spirit without their being circumcised, without their becoming Jews, he had shown that he had received them into his family. But so that these Gentiles, who were now, again, a part of the church, would not offend the Jews who were living around them, the council said they should abstain from certain things. Verse 25, from meat sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from fornication. Now, what is Paul talking about here? And again, think back to Acts 15. What did we see there? Well, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that meat sacrificed to idols is a matter of Christian liberty. Christians can eat meat sacrificed to idols as long as it doesn't stumble. First of all, as long as they're not worshiping that idol, of course, but also as long as it doesn't stumble a brother or sister in Christ. You know, don't use your liberty to stumble a weaker brother. And apparently, if it was because it was offensive to Jews, don't do it in front of them either. Okay, that's what James is saying here. Uh, eating blood or meat that still has blood in it, which basically means an animal that was strangled and wasn't bled properly, is also a matter of liberty in the New Covenant. Perhaps you remember Sinclair Ferguson talking about blood pudding, some of the other disgusting things, you know, that people make to eat, blood sausage. Apparently, it's made out of blood. Can a Christian eat blood in the new covenant? Well, the answer is yes. We have liberty to do that. 
or to eat meat that isn't properly bled. I mean, when's the last time you took a piece of meat, you know, from the, the meat, you know, the grocer or whatever, and you saw this kind of blood sort of coming out of it, you know, sort of swimming in it? Um, they don't, I don't think that, that they properly bleed. It's not kosher, so there's still some blood in it. Can we eat that? Well, uh, of course we can. It's a matter of Christian liberty. But yet, in the ceremonial law, that would have been forbidden because the blood belongs to the Lord. And that would be offensive to the Jews who are, again, zealous for the law, who have not yet had their conscience strengthened to realize they could do something which for years they were not allowed to do. And if you'll recall, the fornication that's mentioned here likely was not referring to sexual immorality, although that is clearly wrong, along with the breaking of the other nine commandments, but more likely was referring more broadly to the spiritual uncleanness that is associated with idolatry, which would also be offensive to the Jews. Now, the Jews believed that Paul had substituted these things for the Mosaic traditions, but he had not done this, okay? He was not either encouraging or discouraging Jews to keep these traditions or not. Uh, he would do it when he was around believing Jews who would and unbelieving Jews, becoming all things to all men, helping the weak. But when he was around the Gentiles, he wouldn't keep it, you know, so as not to put on them some kind of a yoke or, or some other obligations that they felt they needed to, to keep. So he had not substituted these things for the Mosaic traditions, and he hadn't abandoned them either. He hadn't abandoned the, the traditions. So James wanted to clear up the misunderstanding, so he came up with a plan. He says in verses 23 and 24, We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them, and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads, and all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you, but that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. James says, show them that you're not against their traditions. Do these things. Well, these four men were under a Nazarite vow. That's part of the ceremonial law. It was a vow that a person could take where they would consecrate themselves to the Lord for a certain period of time. During that time, they would not touch anything dead. They wouldn't touch anything that had to do with the, with the grape, you know. So they wouldn't eat grapes. They wouldn't drink wine, things of that nature. And they would let their hair grow during the time of that vow. And at the end of that vow, they would shave their heads. Now, Paul had taken this vow earlier. We saw in Acts 18, verse 18, in Cancrea, he had his hair cut because he was keeping a vow. He was keeping this Nazarite vow. So basically, James wanted Paul to take these men into the temple cer ceremonially to purify himself and go with them, and then interestingly, to pay their way. Now, what does that mean, to pay their way? Did it cost money to do this? Well, yeah, it did. They had to make a sacrifice, a sacrifice. They wanted, James wanted Paul to pay for the animals to sacrifice. So they were still making sacrifices as a part of the ceremonial law, which was quite interesting. Certainly not relying on any of these sacrifices to take away their sins or to substitute them for Christ, but the sacrifices that had to do with different parts of the ceremonial law. Apparently, they still had the liberty to do that. James says, do this so the Jews would know you were still keeping the law. And the interesting thing here is, and it shouldn't, shouldn't be that interesting at this point. For the sake of peace, that's what Paul did. We read in verse 26, Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself along with them, went into the temple, giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Now, again, Paul didn't do this because he believed that he was required to keep the ceremonial law. He certainly did not do this because he thought he was justifying himself or these men. He did it to remove the offense that his perceived view of him was creating among his weaker brethren who, as believing Jews did not yet fully understand the liberty that they had in the Lord Jesus Christ to set aside those traditions if they wanted to, 
so that Paul might promote peace among believers. Okay, so he was using his liberty to serve others and to promote the work of the gospel. Now, obviously, this is what our Lord wants us to do. As much as we are able to, to accommodate ourselves to our weaker brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to insist, you know, on our rights, what we have liberty to do in order to do what I want to do and not think about what I'm, what I'm doing, how it's affecting other believers. And I think the classic example of this is the one usually brought up is, is alcohol, drinking, you know. We know that as believers, we have the liberty to drink alcoholic beverages, okay, as long as we do not get drunk. But we also know there are many believers today who don't agree with us on that, think it's absolutely wrong and sinful. So if we happen to be in a public place and we see a brother or sister who believes that it's wrong, and we haven't ordered, let's say, our, you know, a drink yet, if that's what we're getting, then we should think about them. And, and abstain for the sake of peace. Now, remember in the Bible, there's two different ways in which we are to abstain so that we don't injure other people. One is if by my doing it, I actually encourage a brother or sister who believes it's wrong, if I encourage them to drink against their conscience while they still believe it's wrong, I have actually stumbled them. They have actually sinned. Okay, when you do something that is not of faith, you don't believe it's right, you're sinning even if that thing is actually right. So if I use my liberty and this person looks up to me and says, well, if you can do it, I should be able to do it, and they do it, and they're not fully convinced they should do it, I've, I've caused them to sin. Okay, I, I need to make sure, we need to make sure we don't do that to other believers. But the second thing is, even though they're not going to be tempted to drink if I do it, they're still going to find it offensive. They're going to get upset about it, and it's not going to promote peace between us and them. Now, sometimes that's called the tyranny of the weaker brother when they insist that I don't do this, you know, for their sakes because they think I'm wrong. That's another thing. What Paul is telling us here is voluntarily give it up so that you don't create ill will. You don't you know, create the situation where you're at odds with your brother. As much as it depends on us, we need to seek to live at peace with all men. So the point is, use your Christian liberty. We need to use our liberty in Christ to build others up, to love them, okay, to love them, and not insist on doing things because they simply please us. That's what it means to be, again, a servant. That's what it means to be like Christ. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to give us uh, the grace to do this.